I haven't talked to anybody in the last week. <laughs> All right, so with this episode, we dive into the weeds that is facial recognition technology, and we are v very fortunate to have on an actual expert in the field, uh, namely Stephen Keynes. Stephen is a 2019 graduate from the University of Miami Law School, uh, where he concentrated in business innovation, law, and technology. Um, he's now a research fellow at Stanford Codex Center, where his work focuses on the domestic use of facial recognition technology. Um, and so... We with him we get into to all the nitpicky details of FRT and why you as an audience member should be scared and are probably in some <laughs> database. Your face is probably in some <laughs> database that uh, that you don't know about. Um, yeah, yeah. I just add that uh, I went from not really being concerned about this subject at all to being quite concerned. And so Stephen was just an excellent uh, guest and expert to to have on. And um, we'll go to it, into it in detail. But this is technology which is coming and we all should be aware of of it and so in the episode what do we discuss we discuss what is facial recognition technology why we should be concerned um where how and by whom is it being deployed so both in the private and the public sector um and uh, most concerning is the use of facial recognition by police and government um both in the U.S., but also uh, abroad in China in particular. Um, and we also discuss how COVID uh, has impacted the development and um, uh, adoption of facial recognition technology. So overall, it was an, uh, an excellent episode, and I believe we're going to have him back to talk about privacy in, um, in, in a bit more abstract terms uh, in the following episode. So uh, so this will be not the last time you hear from Mr. Stephen Keynes. Yeah, this was, this was an excellent one. I mean, we talk about progress... Uh, a lot on on this podcast and, uh, you know, one thing that progress entails is criticizing technologies as they come out, especially if they're if they're being used in suboptimal ways. And I think this definitely falls into that category. So if this episode doesn't scare the shit out of you, then something is wrong with you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Let the fear begin. Uh, all right, so yeah, happy to have Stephen Keynes with us today, who's a fellow at the law school, um, and uh, not exactly in my position, in a much cooler position, actually. I just someday hope to actually have his job. Uh, but Stephen, I think, yeah, I think we'll probably give you a proper intro in the sort of formal introduction of the episode, but for right now, do you want to just give us a two-minute summary of sort of like what you're doing, what's your position at the law school, and what are you focusing on right now? Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction, Ben. Thank you, uh, Ben and Baden, for both having me. Very excited to be here today. As Ben mentioned, I am a residential fellow at the Codex Center for Legal Informatics at Stanford Law School. Uh, my research focuses on the domestic use of facial recognition and law enforcement use of the technology. And I also co-founded a coronavirus uh, response project called Corona Atlas, which seeks to organize and track legislative orders across the U.S., Damn. So tackling possibly the two most important problems of our time are among the two. So doing very impressive work. Um, it does make me question what I do all day. But I, uh, I watched a lot of Tiger King uh, yeah. over the last <laughs> little while. So that's been equally pretty as valuable. I would yeah. say. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Okay. So yeah, you kicked it off mm. with uh, facial recognition technology, or I guess like FRT, as we'll call it, um, because. I don't want to get tongue tied every time I say it, but yeah, can you just give us like a little um, potted intro to like what facial recognition technology? What is this? Um, and you know, what do people mean? Why they say it? Do different stakeholders have different definitions? Uh, you know, what what are we going to be talking about here? Yeah, so those are some great questions. In a very basic sense, facial recognition is the use of a computer vision algorithm, typically a convolutional neural network to identify and recognize faces from a image. And so what's funny about facial recognition is that we tend to think of it as one algorithm, but it's really a system at scale, really. So in the first sense, you can think of it as hardware. So when we talk about facial recognition and law enforcement, typically there's a network of cameras. That network could also just be images on social media that's been scraped in a sense. Then you have the actual algorithm, which could be developed by like one of tens and now soon to be hundreds of different companies across the world. So it's a very active competitive marketplace, and we can discuss that more later. Thank you. 
Um, and then it's finally like the operators, it's the infrastructure that operates it, right? So facial recognition could be as innocuous as you just unlocking your iPhone. Um, it could be involved in like a field agent and let's say a police officer who has someone under arrest and they don't know who they are and the person's not identifying themselves. It could be used in investigations on like a national scale, for instance, by the FBI. Uh, it could be used in also advertising. There's so many different use cases and people who interact with facial recognition. Um, and it's funny to also just see their level of sophistication in terms of competency. So it could be someone who's as simple as taking a picture and just getting a green arrow or a red no, or it could be someone who's actually an analyst who has like, you know, significant amounts of training and has invested a lot of time in kind of understanding the more nuances of each system. But in a broad sense, facial recognition is just using an algorithm to identify a known person for the purposes of security, identification, um, and a wide variety of uses. Can I add something to that? So um, it, most uh, listeners, I think, are familiar with Google's reverse image search where you put in say, uh, a chair, and it brings back a bunch of chairs that are very similar. Uh, but if you try, I tried this uh, just with my own image, and if I put in my face, it brings back a bunch of pictures of males. Um, but it doesn't bring back uh, all of my personal Facebook photos, uh, links to my personal web page, um, and childhood photos uh, uh, that were on the internet for about 10 minutes and then taken, taken off. Um, but when we're talking about facial recognition technology, that's what... I think people should have in mind, which is you can put in an image of uh, somebody you've just taken on the street, put it in, and it will bring back everything on the internet about that person. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's like a reverse image search for, for individuals. And, uh, and that is an incredibly powerful uh, technology, which Google can do, but has chosen not to do. And that's, I think, the space of what we're going to be talking about. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So can you maybe just give us a sense of how ubiquitous the technology is? Like, yeah, who's using it? Um, under what circumstances are people having their faces scanned? Who gets to see these images? Um, and yeah, when and how are the images used? So one fascinating thing about facial recognition is that you can have uses that are a little bit more forward looking or even retrospective. So when I say that you could buy a phone today that has facial recognition features, so you unlock it um, in situations such as like China, it's now required that every time you get a new SIM card, you actually have to register with facial recognition. And there's a lot of banking and different types of services that also use it. Um, so I would say that each society has a different level of integration with it. China is definitely very heavily leaning on it. The US is kind of a little bit more um, in the private sector. We're seeing a lot of it. In our technologies, but then there's also uh, starting to become a little bit more ubiquitous in our law enforcement. And there's this concept of interconnectivity, for instance. So there's a paper that came out of Georgetown a few years ago called the Perpetual Lineup that actually showed that the FBI uh, supports facial recognition efforts for over 22,000 law enforcement agencies. And there's this notion of even if you may not have the technology yourself as a law enforcement agency, you may have an agreement with another department that does. So all you have to do is provide the photo of a suspect and that person can run it on their system and kind of get it back to you. So I think what's really interesting, too, is that when we talk about facial recognition, it used to be almost safe to have it built in-house by a vendor or someone on your team. But access can always just be kind of given. We're even seeing just basic licenses, very similar to how you have like a Microsoft Word type system to where um, people can just get, gain licenses to very powerful systems and networks, even though they may not have had any kind of investment in the creation of it. Yeah. One, one interesting point which you brought up uh, in sort of another podcast episode you did, which we'll link to, um, was that... Uh, you know, police departments and uh, vendors, uh, or, or rather, um, users of, of the of the technology, might be sharing info across domains. So, I think you use the example of like Baltimore. Like, I don't, if you've never been to Baltimore, um, it doesn't matter if a police department, um, are you know, in in LA has your picture, um, they might be sharing this information with the police department in Baltimore. And then, as soon as you show up there, um, you are in that da database. And so it's not necessarily the use of the technology is not necessarily um, confined to, to the physical locations you've been, but could be sort of shared across the network, which is um, and yeah, an interesting proposition for technology is as powerful as this. Um, and so I guess, yeah, maybe one thing just to like set sort of the tone of the conversation here, like, are you are you worried about this technology? Are you optimistic? Um, what's your general take on on the state of affairs right now when it comes to this? I would say I'm very concerned. Uh, I myself have spent some time working in the nonprofit and legal aid sector. And so I'm very familiar with how technology often has a disproportionate effect. And so within facial recognition, we're already seeing certain cities like Detroit and Chicago, uh, who have very high minority and often low income populations that are really embracing facial recognition for certain criminal um, 
investigation techniques. And two people I want to identify right now are Robert John Julian Borshak and Michael Oliver, and these two men specifically, because recently they were both falsely arrested in the city of Detroit due to their facial recognition system. So to back up a little bit, when I was talking about infrastructure earlier, Detroit has a system known as Project Greenlight. And so essentially it's an agreement between the police department and private landowners for them to place cameras on their property that the police have control and access to. And so the fascinating thing about Project Greenlight is that initially it didn't really have facial recognition integrated with it. Now certain people are, um, or now there are plans to introduce facial recognition into it. And it kind of goes to show that when you have an increased surveillance state, you kind of also increase the probability that you'll have misidentifications and subsequently false arrests. So these two men separately were arrested for crimes that they did not commit. Um, and it was only during trial that they were able to determine, or actually, sorry, during one of their trials, they were able to determine that it wasn't them. And the other one, before they went to trial, they were able to, to determine that it wasn't, in fact, him mm -hmm. as well. So what's fascinating about this is as we embrace technology, such as facial recognition, I think that each individual citizen and subsequently department, you almost have to make a decision about what is your comfortability with your margin of error, right. right? So like, let's assume that this will happen. How many people are you comfortable with getting misidentified and misarrested, right? And, or, or falsely arrested, rather. And you can almost get into an economics argument of like, you know, benefits and costs, right? Because in theory, it could decrease crime in one area, mm -hmm. but then in the invasions of privacy have a subsequent negative effect. So there's a lot of conversations being discussed right now, exactly where are you comfortable with margins of error and like what should be lost? What are things that are kind of um, unacceptable losses? Can I, yeah, can I chime in? So um, I want to... Uh, zoom out a, a little bit and just tell people my experience of learning about this subject because uh, Stephen, you're obviously representing um, uh, Codex. You said is the the, uh, the team team you with, Correct. and so I, I think you're being strategically neutral um, because it's obviously a very uh, uh, wide ranging technology. But like I am, I went from not knowing at all about this to being quite worried. And so I want to hopefully put some of the worry into, into our listeners. Um, and so what are we talking about? So uh, we're talking about the ability to say, be uh, watching television and see a cute extra and take a photo of them uh, and then immediately find out where they live. Uh, because you could, facial recognition technology allows you to take images of anybody you want and find their Facebook find uh, the, the university which they attended, any online information whatsoever. So you could imagine, say, being at a bar and uh, having an app on your phone that just allows you to scan a room um, and there's two or three cute girls on the, at the end of the bar. And then you look up, okay, so she's from Stanford, she studies econ, okay, good, I'm going to go and approach her. Um, this is what we're, we're talking about. We're talking about the ability to instantly find any information about human beings um, and the thing that scares me so much is that uh, the technology is like, so we're hopefully going to eventually talk about Clearview AI. Um, and Clearview AI, uh, the, the, the CEO, like one of the creepiest dudes I think I've ever um, listened to on YouTube. But he, he's not some tech genius. Like what he's done, I could do if I had like $500,000. It's just taking, uh, making a little app, a little software thing that, takes all of the images off Facebook and Instagram, and then trains a uh, facial recognition uh, uh, CNN, which, again, I could do it if I'd had a lot of money. Um, that's the only thing that's preventing me because having all the GPUs and the storage and stuff. And so this technology is both going to be super powerful and super ubiquitous. Um, and as you were saying, there's many different uses to which it could be put. So uh, it could be put to um, just identifying criminals, uh, and that would be really nice. Um, but it could also be put to, say, uh, the pickup artist world, and they could use it in, in all sorts of different ways. So we're talking about this very powerful thing, which people aren't, I think, taking uh, uh, seriously because it's just seen as uh, the newest technology. And so I think your work is so valuable. Um, and, and when we start going into examples of how it's being used, um, I just want everyone to keep in mind that uh, like this is going to be here in the next... 10 years, and, and what I think is so valuable about your work is um, it's proposing different uh, concrete policy recommendations for different uh, sectors in society, so for legislators um, and for uh, citizens and for tech uh, engineers and stuff. And so um, I just wanted to put all that uh, into the, 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 the conversation because I've 
successfully been con um, persuaded that this is a, a subject which more people need to to take uh, quite quite seriously. Um, so I don't. Yeah, I don't know if you want to reflect on that, yeah, but so. uh, but that was me just dumping like my fear about this whole subject into into the conversation. But yeah. No, absolutely. I, I believe this is really a serious subject, and I think that I may have just been staring into the proverbial abyss for too long, <laughs> so I'm a little bit comfortable here, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, it really is a transformational technology, and like just to back up a little bit, definition-wise, this is a biometric identifier, so it observes some physiological or behavioral characteristic about mm -hmm. yourself, and. What's fascinating about your face is that it has a high rate of immutability, yeah. meaning that it cannot be changed, say, for like surgery or hormones or some type of accident, for instance. And I think that facial recognition as a technology up until about the last, like, let's say three years, it faced two major constraints that you both identified in your last point. So the first was data. Facial recognition systems actually originally began on college campuses, and they would pay students or give them, you know, let's say credit and just part, uh, for participating in studies where they would take pictures of their face, side profile sometimes. There are data sets that are created for different reasons. So, for instance, some are based on twins, right? And so that's trying mm -hmm. to, uh, to identify two related indiv individuals, mm -hmm. for instance. Um, and what's fascinating about facial recognition is as, it, as it's grown, certain government databases have started to be used for facial recognition without the consent of the people mm -hmm. that have it. So, for instance... Certain states' DMVs are now being used for facial recognition technology. And so when you think about it, um, when you, when you like go there, you're 16, you're really excited to get your driver's mm -hmm. permit, no one tells you that this could be used against you in a criminal investigation subsequently later. And same thing with a lot of the documents that you know certain people um, give to the immigration and customs enforcement and um, other types of organizations when they're immigrating to this country. Like those, that information is now being used. And so the original issue, though, is that the average person may only have, like, let's say, five photos that they've submitted to the government, right? So originally they didn't have that much information for you. You mentioned Clearview AI, which is a new, very controversial AI company that has been scraping Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, mm -hmm. Venmo, all these major social media sites um, for photos. And what's fascinating about this is that there are typically constitutional protections that protect the government mm -hmm. from doing that. But if they essentially just you know, play hide the ball and they get a vendor that's able to do it and then they pay for access to that service, they skirt around the issue with technically, mm -hmm. with, without technically having a violation. And so the data constraint that was originally faced by law enforcement agencies and other um, stakeholders is now being surpassed by the scraping of media, right? And so when you have people that have, like, let's say, extremely open public profiles who may have hundreds of photos of their faces under different lighting and different angles, now you're able to have a much greater certainty when you do take that picture of someone in mm -hmm. public and then you try to match mm -hmm. them. So the notion of diminished privacy is a very real thing, and it's part of the issue of scraping, right? And scraping is not necessarily illegal. It, it often goes against terms of services, mm -hmm. but typically there's very little repercussions for you breaking them aside from maybe a cease mm -hmm. and desist letter where they shake mm -hmm. their finger. Um, very little real penalties have been actually been like um, actualized. And then so in addition to the data constraint that they originally faced that they surpassed, um, there's also one of access. And as you mentioned, uh, there are a number of services now that essentially just allow you to pay a small fee. And then you have access to an extremely powerful tool that previously was only in the hands of a few people. And even now you can just find Jupyter Notebooks, just build your own facial recognition exactly. system, right? And so what makes it very... Uh, Shocking, and some people may call it even democratized, if you will, in that the barrier to entry has dropped so low, is that all you need is a data set of labeled faces. You just need labeled data of faces of um, typically quality information, but as the algorithms progress, they can work with uh, lower quality images. And that's often where a lot of these issues come in with often criminal justice. Um, there's a case of the University of Florida, or sorry, not the University of Florida, I take that back, I apologize the state of Florida versus mm -hmm. Willie Lynch, where a man was um, arrested, convicted, and sentenced off of a photo from a track mm -hmm. phone. And for those of you who don't know, track phones are very similar to burner phones or just low quality images, very far from your standard mm -hmm. iPhone. Um, so the issue of just image control and just those baselines are often not established in very powerful systems that have real tangible effects. Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of dealing with very powerful technology, very little guardrails on each side, and a lot of decisions that are left up to people in rooms that may have very little knowledge of like the implications of their yeah, design. Yeah, the, um, um, I just want to reiterate that the only thing that's preventing most people in, uh, let's say, undergrad from making this is just a sense of uh, uh, ethics, I think. Like, it's not technologically difficult. It's just most people realize that this is breaching some uh, invisible line that like we shouldn't cross, but then you have social yeah, contract. Yeah, the social contract. Exactly. But then you have this, uh, like, uh, Juan Tan Tat dude, who's just like, nah, I don't really care about these social contracts. I'm just going to do it anyways. Um, but 
but okay, let's let's uh, let's try our best to uh, steel man the other side for a little bit because um, in Perpetual Lineup, which is uh, the the paper you recommended, it's online. Uh, I would recommend it to everybody. It was excellent, um, and uh, they are the ones who who do a very comprehensive, I think, uh, summary of this problem uh, as well as what's coming and um, some concrete policy recommendations. And so. When I was reading through the recommendations, there is this interesting, I think, tension between some of the recommendations were uh, basically saying, let's have less of this through regulation, um, through public awareness. But then other uh, recommendations were saying, let's make it better. Let's, let's, um, let's make it less biased. Let's make sure that we're up to date with the technology. Um, and so it's, I say this because even in, I think, uh, perpetual lineup, um, they recognize that there are some valid uses uh, of this technology. And so um, I think we should maybe spend a bit of time talking about like uh, what would be the valid uses and, and do our best to, to steal in um, those who are advocating for, for um, uh, face recognition technology. Definitely. And I think that what's fascinating is the use cases themselves. We can identify certain positive or innocuous uses. However, I feel it always comes down to the mm-hmm. operator. Mm-hmm. So when I say that, it, you have to really truly believe that the person operating the system has not only some basic form of like, you know, moral right and wrong, they can follow a literal policy, and then also anyone else who is their subordinate will also do so. So when I bring that up, um, I want to point to certain issues that law enforcement has had with, let's say, abusing DMV databases mm-hmm. and officers looking up, like, let's say, attractive women or their ex-wives mm-hmm. and just stalking certain people and the misuse of surveillance technology as a whole. Right. So that's happened in various other situations. And I'm not trying to say that necessarily I never trust law enforcement, but I think it's very important to um, note that. But also, uh, I just want to say that the technology... So I'll give you a concrete example. Facial recognition has been used to identify victims of child sexual abuse and and child trafficking, which is an an issue that I don't think anyone will ever object that that is um, a non-valid purpose and does not have like, you know, all of the moral pinnings that we should that we should aim for when we implement technology within our criminal justice system. But the issue is, is that sometimes it's offered as pretext. So, for instance, uh, license plate readers. Originally, we were told that they would only be used to find stolen cars and uh, and abducted children, right? And then it was later used, like the technology was later used by ICE to find undocumented immigrants. And so the issue is that sometimes when you build something, you may have the best intentions, and then there may be people that give you a reason as for why it will only be used in this nature, but it is not subsequently here to use for a greater purpose, which is what we call mission creep. So that's something that's like very common. And I think that you can still kind of green light certain applications, but I think that it's very key to have certain things like, let's say, auditing, right? So every time someone uses that search, there should be several people to get an alert, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think also the issue of thresholds, uh, when you look at, like, let's say, Amazon's recognition, which is spelled with a K, which is their facial recognition offering, um, oftentimes officers and law enforcement agencies are allowed to play with the thresholds, even if the policy specifically says a certain threshold should be used when they're displaying um, an output. So just for our listeners who may not be familiar, when you're doing a search query, right? So you have an unknown image and then you search it against a known database and then it spits out a certain amount of results. Um, in terms of the UI UX design of the program, sometimes you can move the threshold so you can include more. So it'll produce more results with less certainty. Mm-hmm. So if you have a high threshold, typically you'll have a lower quantitative okay. amount of results. Um, and so that kind of keeps, that's almost like a little barrier. And in some systems you would just develop it. So that threshold is just a set number and you can't design around it. But other times you're a little allowed to play with it a little bit, right? And so the issue becomes is that when you have traditional systems of evidence, like let's say a blood test, right? Um, you have something called a lab certificate, which proves that it was ran in a standardized ethical manner. And even though you have different machines that can analyze blood, you typically only have a few finite amount of ways that you can, quote, do it right. With facial recognition, you're now allowing people to almost intervene in the process. There's no standardization. Like I mentioned, there's a bunch of different um, models out there and there's a bunch of different vendors. And it's very hard to know that one search query is equal to another um, in terms of integrity. And that's really what we're trying to get at here. So the issue is not just one of what is the specific use case, but is this a specific system used now is that um, algorithm designed in an ethical fair way and then also in any subsequent retrainings or updates have um, those principles still being met, been maintained I'd like to uh, I'd like to pause for just a second on this concept of mission creep because I think this is fascinating and important and also um, may 
change some people's minds who hold something like the following position, right? I think there's some people listening who would say, you know what, you know, I'm not doing anything illegal on a day-to-day basis. And so I don't care if a police department has my face or something, right? Like, I don't care. You should only worry about this if you're actually doing something wrong. I have nothing to hide and therefore I'm not going to worry about this. But I think what Mission Creep um, as a concept demonstrates is that this can start infringing on everyday aspects of your life that as in like a free and open society we don't want to have right so presumably we want some amount of independence and freedom from the state um just to be able to live like open lives free of fear right and so um what mission creep why it's so powerful is um because it you know it identifies the ways that seemingly innocuous technology when first put in place can its its scope can expand over time until the government for example has um a complete knowledge of your whereabouts at, at at all times or your ex can search you up and know exactly where you are at all times or any of these things so even you know even people sitting there that they they don't think they're you know breaking the law they don't have anything to worry about um can can have uh, sort of their freedom impinged in this way on a, uh, yeah, on a, so in a I kinda, way. I, yeah, I, I want to push back on you guys a, a tiny little bit because um, I, I think that there is um, a difference between mission creep uh, as applied to a technology and mission creep as applied to a set of regulations governing that, te- that technology. So, for example, um, one could say that at the advent of the internet, that, well, you know what, this thing's going to get bigger and bigger, and, and then it's going to have child molesters on there, and it's going to have pornographers, and it's going to have, um, like, radical websites on there. And that's true. That is that is mission creep. But it also has Wikipedia, and it has the ability to have podcast conversations like this. Um, and so I would be reluctant to say that we should stop developing a technology because the potential for uh, of mission creep for this technology. Um, I would prefer to say that... Certain technologies are coming, and we need to be very careful about the regulations and uh, use the, our, the tool of regulation to, to make sure that, say, apps that allow you to scan a room and immediately detect uh, people in that room are, are um, uh, going to be uh, disallowed, or that uh, communities have to, say, have a, a vote if they want to uh, institute a facial recognition, um, uh, uh, say, green zone in their in their community, and then... Um, take it out uh, after like a, a vote with a sunset clause. Say so. I, I guess I want to to say that we shouldn't just stop the development of technology because it has the potential for mission creep. Um, and instead, we should say that because this technology has the potential for mission creep, we need to constantly be uh, reevaluating our regulatory uh, uh, framework that governs the uh, the usage of such technology. Um, I put that to you to see if, if if I miss something or if that you think it's a fair distinction. Yeah, so I hear what you're saying. I think I'm going to nice. push back. On oh, great. So, <laughs> uh, so first, I do agree that there are two types of mission yeah. creep. I, I will say that. But I don't think that the regulatory mission creep can occur unless the first one, mm. which is in the hardware and the specific deployment specifically occurs. So to give you an example of, and just to respond to Ben's earlier question of what about someone that says you're not yeah. doing it, like, you know, I'm not doing anything mm-hmm. illegal. Like, what's the issue here? So we all have certain things that we do that we would probably like to remain private, or at least private in certain circumstances, right? So there's things that you may do on the weekend that are perfectly fine and legal, but you may not want your boss to know that. If we have a network of cameras, and if either facial recognition is baked into that network, or someone just has access to the video feed, and they can use facial recognition, or to social media, so go to any parade, or back when we had those, right? (laughs) Or any concerts, and you know, you can just do it after the fact retrospectively. So the issue is, let's say that you are a person who is uh, LGBTQ, but you're not out yet, right? And you you go to a community center. If there's a camera outside there, someone can identify you and then use that to harass you. Another example would be abortion clinics, right? People could place a camera right outside an abortion clinic and even if they're not a member of the government they can use that to identify you and harass you and so i think that if we point to certain groups and like let's say for instance so i worked at the cyber civil rights initiative which combats cyber sexual harassment and non-consensual pornography and like so i've seen how technology can be weaponized against certain groups and so to your point about we shouldn't necessarily develop i think that one thing that's very interesting about this concept of privacy that no one's thinking about 
is that with these real-time surveillance networks of cameras, um, and I'm going to use the example of, let's say, San Francisco, there is a, uh, I, I, his last name is Larson, I believe. Uh, he made his fortune off of Ripple uh, cryptocurrency, but he's essentially paying for certain neighborhoods to establish their own network of cameras, right? And so you might say, what's the issue with this? If this is meant to protect property crime, it's that even if you have, so let's say you have this network of cameras and people can tune in that are members of the community and things like that. If you have that, um, there's also this notion of inferential privacy that comes about, right? So if I know you are here on this camera, that's one thing. But also if I have cameras everywhere but one neighborhood and I know that you're at least in the city, let's say I corroborate that with your cell phone tower or something like that, the fact that you're not appearing on any of these other lenses, if facial recognition is good enough to do real-time um, on all those cameras, that in and of itself is a message, right? So I think that the notion of we shouldn't let it impede progress. While I generally agree with most technologies, I think that facial recognition, we have a tipping point, right? And the tipping point is that once I have a thousand photos of myself tagged, it's going to be one, very hard for me ever to not be identified in subsequent things. But also two, I believe within the next few years, with enough photos of someone, you will be able to fake certain elements of facial recognition. And people use different um, technologies to make sure that that doesn't happen. So for instance, technologies to make sure this is a 3D mapping of an actual face and not a mask. And there's also all these different, there's like counter surveillance methods and then things that people used to counter mm. that. So it's always going to be like this little tug of war. But the issue is, is that if I have enough images of your face and let's say that there's a low end provider that isn't really that good, I might be able to access your bank records if you have a certain system that's connected in that manner, right? Mm. So there may be a day when someone has enough of your biometric information to where they can start faking it as you. And it might even be better if you don't have anything currently activated. So you might just say, oh, I'll just sit it out. But like, let's hypothetically say, someone has enough of your faces and they can reconstruct a model or a mask or something like that. And there have been people that have been able to 3D print masks that pass just basic systems, like let's say entry points into a building. Um, if it ever gets, if it ever, if it ever progresses to that level rather, um, we're going to see a, a lot of fraud specifically. <laughs> and so I think that the best way to prevent that is to prevent the proliferation and integration of these technologies at such a wide okay. scale and just maintain some things that are just non-facial recognition. and integration. So, so the pushback, I think is, I, I agree with it is that, uh, yeah, yeah. Your, your internet analogy, um, kind of presupposes that there's like a, a, a lot of good things that are going to come from it and some bad things. But if I say used uh, nuclear weapons as an example, <laughs> um, then, there's not very many good things that are going to come from that, and so I guess you're kind of you're 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 making the argument that on average um, the development is going to be intrinsically to, uh, harmful, uh, and the harm is going to outweigh any uh, good things that could come of it, such as um, I, I think Taylor Swift used facial recognition technology uh, on some of her concert goers to scan for known um, uh, stalkers and harassers of, of Taylor Swift, uh, and so that would be one say positive case, but the uh, the vast majority of, of, of things that could be done with this technology are going to be harmful. And that's um, where the argument is that we should uh, slow the development of such technology. Is that a fair uh, summary of, of your perspective? Yeah. yeah. And so what's, what's very funny about that too, is that um, I've, I've discussed that specific example before too. So I don't disagree that that original motivator of wanting to not have stalkers at your, at your concert is bad. But I think that what's fascinating is we have to ask a few more questions, right? So first of all, who is manning the feed, right? Like who is operating the feed? Is it Miami PD, for instance, if it is in Miami, right? And is that system integrated with like, let's say a known warrant system? So let's say you have an outstanding warrant because you didn't pay your parking tickets or something like that, for instance. There's a fear often in protesting now and even just expressing your First Amendment of going in crowds if you have an active warrant, even though you may be able to go a certain amount of time without them ever really finding you. Um, so for instance, during the um, Freddie Gray protests, police actually record, they were recording the protesters to later identify them. And that's something that people are now seeing, right? And they're saying that, oh, when you post pictures in a protest, for instance, you should de-identify a lot of the photos, make sure you take a screenshot of the original image to remove the metadata, and just kind of like introducing a little bit more privacy and anonymity. Cool. Um, so yeah, it, it definitely is a very independent use case specific consideration, I'd almost say, that I think that each time you ask yourself, is facial recognition right for this problem? You need to really drill down and look at it from a technical aspect, from like a, mm -hmm. just a human, where is the human in the loop and those types mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Yeah, good, good pushback. I, uh, okay, so I want to, one of you mentioned sort of this analogy with uh, like th the nuclear bomb at one point, which I'd like to examine a little bit more closely, because in that case, um, we sort of put a moratorium on people building nukes at the moment. And why this is effective is because you can't have high school students building nukes in their basement, right? That's that's not possible. But um, 
generally, <laughs> generally proud of. What about if they have Jupiter notebooks? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, and so, this is like a disanalogy with facial recognition, right? Because if we, if like everyone who's quote unquote responsible agrees to to not use it, this still opens the landscape to to rogue actors who might develop it on their on their own and then deploy the technology. So I'm just wondering, sort of, assuming we agree that the cons outweigh the pros in the case of, of facial recognition. Um, how, you know, what's what's the path forward there? How do you actually actually put a sort of a, a moratorium on nefarious cases when the technology is just becoming sort of more and more accessible by the day, um, even by, you know, just people in undergrad and uh, and people like Vaden it's, who are just, just going to go build it, <laughs> build it any second as soon as he gets his hand on too many GPUs? Well, I think one thing I want to point out is that the difference between a private individual using it and the government using it is often the integration with other mm. technologies. So, for instance, in California, there's a bill 1215 that specifically prohibits its integration with police body cameras. So I agree that, like, let's say there's a dude who name, whose name is Ron, who's very creepy, that builds a facial recognition and uses that to just identify people on the street. That is adverse, but as an individual those effects will be rel- hopefully mm-hmm. relatively mm-hmm. minor, right? And then, but now if you use like, let's say the police as an example, if every body camera you came across, so for instance, um, one day I was driving in California and I witnessed like this bad accident with like this pedal bike in his car. This dude had like a really bad compound fracture and I was like talking to the police when they came because they're getting a statement. And like, I was like looking at the police officer's body camera and I was just thinking like, what if there was facial recognition mm-hmm. on that, right? And it's like, what are the longstanding impacts? And like, I don't have any active warrants, don't have any criminal history. But like, I was thinking like, what if like, would, as a witness to a violent, to like, not even a violent crime, that was an accident. But as a witness to an accident, for instance, would I be less likely to talk to police if I knew that facial recognition was a thing and it was like more around. So I think that it's, it's very key to kind of look at the longstanding um, uh, implications, like in terms of integration. So just to bring it back a little bit. I think that there's a difference between the government using it and an individual using it. And we're also seeing legislatively that being a difference. So when we say San Francisco has banned facial recognition, what that really means is that government agencies and employees are banned from using facial recognition um, within the scope of their job. And then um, individual private citizens are not barred from doing so. Um, but what's fascinating is if you look at other states, like let's say Illinois, there's something called the Biometric Information Privacy Act, and it's being been used in a couple major lawsuits, specifically, um, even specifically within facial recognition. So for instance, I believe in Illinois, there, uh, group, there was a class action suit specifically because uh, Facebook d- it essentially automatically opted you into facial recognition um, on your profile without kind of asking you to do so. And so there's a class action suit of a bunch of people from Illinois. And they had originally reached a $550 million settlement, but it was announced a few days ago that the judge felt that that was inadequate and he's sending them back for a kind of greater consideration. So I think that there are different means to restrain um, facial recognition. You can do it by restraining the integrations. You can do it by restraining the parties, right? So government or um, public sector, Um and then you can just do like all out bans for both people, for both parties, which is a little bit rare. But I think that you need to be a little bit creative with your uh, legislation. So for me personally, I think that it's in everybody's best interest for all of us to come together and identify what are those certain prohibited um, integrations, right? Like what are the things that are absolutely off limits? And then we work our way towards mm-hmm. the center. Because the biggest issue when I started doing this research is I almost tried to create an ethical scale of deployment, right? So essentially saying um, – Let's assume that the that the software baseline works and there are minimal discrepancy in like age, gender, and race, right? Let's assume that. And that's a really big if, but let's just assume we have this magical thing that's like relatively error proof, right? We could say that we won't use it for small for smaller um, crimes and we'll only use it for like more intensive things, right? Like let's say murder, for instance, um, because of like let's say if that's the sole piece of evidence and it's like something that has that burden and we agree that the weight of that crime is so heavy, right? If you have people that will agree in one scenario, um, like, let, okay, so let's assume that if it is for a minor crime, uh, we will not use facial recognition mm-hmm. for like in a very high level crime such as homicide, we will use facial recognition. So if, if we have that example, everything in the middle is more of a personal 
a question of what you think is ethically right, a serious crime or not a serious crime. So when I say that, like strong arm robbery can be lightly as defined as someone plucking your cell phone from your finger on a skateboard as they ride as they ride by. That's technically strong arm mm-hmm. robbery. So the question of whether you think that's a serious crime, that's a personal distinction. Like for me, if it was nonviolent, not that serious. For someone else, you could say, hey, that's twelve hundred dollars. That's how I run my business. I actually don't have a laptop. Like you know, I have all the photos of my kitten on there, and so the sentimental value is ridiculously high. Like give that man the chair, right? Like I can see people like you know making those kind to of the arguments. Chair. So it's funny that we can agree on the extremes, yeah. but the the middle that's the hard part, right? Because those are personal distinctions. And I can tell you what I feel, but I guarantee, given enough scenarios, we'd all feel differently about different scenarios. Yeah. Okay. So I I, uh, I don't feel like we've sufficiently um, steel manned the other side, and I was trying to think of use cases which I would support, and so I want to be uh, uh, try to be a little provocative because it's fun. Um, and here here's one use case that I think I would tentatively support, and I'm looking forward to having you demolish it. But um, I could ima- so one of the recommendations from um, the uh, Perpetual Lineup Project was to have a community involvement, so making sure that a community uh, knows this is going to be implemented and um, has the control to implement it and, and, and uh, de-implement it. Um, and so I'm contrasting this powerful technology against the current conversation of defund the police. Um, and so consider the scenario where there's a particularly uh, very high crime community um, that has a problem with the police and they, as a community, opt to, say, for a year, uh, implement, say, a 20 block radius where you're going to have um, facial recognition technology instead of active police uh, 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 involvement. Um, And if this is public knowledge, and if I know that when I'm going into this area, um, anonymity is going to be taken from me in in return for um, hopefully lower crime. I could see this as being at least an interesting uh, option. So the the focus would be um, facial recognition with full public awareness such that you get this collective action thing happening where nobody wants to act illegally instead of poor policing. That is the strongest um, pro facial recognition uh, case I could, I could make. And to that, I would add uh, a sunset clause because it's very important that when you uh, put in policies that are going to res- take people's liberties away, um, they automatically expire so that if the policies don't work, then you don't just have this uh, loss of liberty and, um, and, and that's it. So, so, what do you think of that example? So in this hypothetical system, just as a quick question, if like, let's say a crime is detected, someone like stole someone's purse or something, right? Who responds to that call? Is it still the police that will come in and then intervene? Presumably, yeah. So instead of having, um, let's say parole, uh, uh, sorry, patrol, um, the patrolling is uh, replaced with public awareness that in this square radius, um, we have widespread facial recognition technology instead. And so it's, it's an instead, and it's an instead because there's all sorts of problems with policing, um, and there's all sorts of problems with face recognition technology, and I could see this being a trade-off, um, and a temporary trade-off. Yeah. And then the police would, uh, then so somebody steals a cell phone, um, then that information would be sent to the police, and the police would um, presumably do what they do. <laughs> and maybe that's the weak spot in the argument. Uh, so, so maybe we should pick at that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry. Just one more yeah. question. I apologize. I'm asking some yeah, yeah, conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... If we take traffic stops aside, are we sure that the majority of these like police brutality type incidences are the result of pat- of police coming upon people when they're patrolling and not being specifically called for incidences? Because couldn't the same amount of violence happen upon a population simply because someone called or there was a reported Sorry. crime? And just going back to the earlier false arrest. Um, they used facial recognition after the crime had been committed. So the person had like robbed the store the week before, a few days mm-hmm. before, and they used it after the fact. And then they came in and they got him. So it's like there's still the risk of those adverse things, but I'll, I'll play with the yeah, no, um, um, to so, your, uh, to your questions. My answer is I have no idea. Um, I, I, am making this up in the sense of like, I recognize all of these problems with, uh, uh, facial recognition technology. Um, but there is this, I think, um, pacifying effect of a panopticon of knowing that you're always going to be watched. And that's why, um, uh, protesters cover their face, and often when you cover your face and you uh, increase anonymity, uh, violence goes up. And so if you decrease anonymity, it 
stands to reason that, um, uh, again, as long as everybody knows about it, uh, violence could could go down. And then all of the, the real world messiness that you're bringing to the question is is valid, to which I say I have no idea. <laughs> I, I am, yeah. And the anonymity yeah. thing that you just said, though, that's pointed towards specifically during protests and certain movements, mm-hmm. right? That's not in day to day. I'm in the grocery store, like wearing a clown that's mask. True. And then yeah, I'm just going to like, yeah, like right? Yeah, 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 OK, yeah. cool. OK, so I would say. There's always a trade off, and we identified this earlier. I think Ben had mentioned that too, in terms of liberties and security. Mm-hmm. And I would say that the issue with facial recognition being implemented instead of that is that if you look at like China, they're developing like a social credit system that is being supported with the use of facial recognition. And so my fear is that. In the same way that it's weird that when I use my debit card, Google can know what I purchased and then serve me ads on that, completely irrespective of my internet search history, they just have knowledge of how your debit card's being used. I feel that if like, let's say you're at a CVS and you buy liquor regularly, and then like, you know, your insurance, when you come to get a new plan, like, hey, do you drink and you say no, and then this information's out there, for instance, I'm afraid that the over collection of information and activities, right? They'll also know who you meet with. They'll also know exactly like, you know, where your car is, even though that's like registered to a state system. But my point is, in addition to being able to detect crime, they'll also be able to detect specific movement, activities, and people that you hang out with in your associations. And so I believe that over time, given that that camera would be outside your house for at least a year or two, right, they may be able to detect certain things about your life that they never would have regularly patrolling. Mm-hmm. And so it's a constant surveillance and the movement of other people in relation to yourself mm-hmm. that I feel that that is the most egregious overextension of security. So, like, I would much rather, like, you know, a little bit of low um, – intense like crime if it means that my privacy is being preserved yeah interesting so i there's this like there's this fundamental trade-off between um yeah let's say privacy and uh, a bunch of other things that people value so the internet example is, is an excellent one because um of course i want privacy but i also want free facebook and free google maps and free um everything right and i'm willing to give up a bit of my tr- privacy uh in order to get the uh, the high quality technology which um, which which we get, and so I see privacy as much more of a a chip which people are willing to barter than this absolute thing which they have and can never be relinquished. Um, and so, in this hypothetical high crime neighborhood, um, like maybe the hypothetical has lost all use, um, but I'm just imagining that uh, there is a pacifying effect of knowing you're being surveilled. Um, and nobody wants that, of course not. But if we're talking about very high crime neighborhoods um, where people constantly feel um, under threat, like ta Coates writes about how he grew up in, in um, I think it was Baltimore, actually. Uh, and every single day he was terrified of being um, uh, assaulted with, with uh, gangs and with police. Um, this is a terrible way to feel when you're walking to, walking to school. Um, and to this person... Uh, would they be willing to trade that feeling for a feeling of, of loss of privacy? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Um, but I know that we so, all at least trade some of our privacy implicitly through the decisions that we make. And I think we're to the better for it. So the question is, what is being traded and what are we being um, uh, given in return? Cool. So I guess two things. So the first would be that the notion that people barter for their privacy. I think they do that, though, because they don't understand the value of their privacy. Okay. I don't think they understand the cumulative value of knowing all these different data points. I agree that like no one, like people knowing that I listened to Panic at the Disco <laughs> once on a Thursday is not, like, you know, in and of itself inherently. Depends on which song, I guess. But. But I, <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> But I think that once you put that together with a bunch of other things, you might be able to market me something when I walk into a target that's like irresistible in a sense, right? And I think that the consumer sector has really been trending towards predictive technology and sentiment analysis. Mm -hmm. And people often present it as like, isn't that great? That's just more of what you want all the time. Mm -hmm. But I want to point out two things. Number one, it's a little bit creepy when your YouTube algorithms are almost a little bit Mm -hmm. too good and they know the exact content that you have. And sometimes too... Even though your predictive score may be very high for a certain activity, the outcome may not be something that you want. So, for instance, 
um, target, like introduce a predictive system where based on what you're searching, they could predict not only whether you were pregnant, but if you were, what trimester you were in, right? And so like there's issues with certain people who like, let's say you have your internet search history to that sense where you're getting a bunch of advertisements about pre- being pregnant and you actually are. But then like, let's say, unfortunately, there's a miscarriage mm-hmm. or something and then you subsequently keep getting those mm-hmm. ads. Similar things happen to people who actually have issues with drug, drugs and mm-hmm. alcohol to where like a lot of the content you see might be towards that. And like, let's say you try to get clean one day and you continuously continue being served those ads. And there's other things where we as people just go through transformations where we become different people. And we may not necessarily want to be bound by the wealth of information that they have about us. Um, Similar things might be like, let's say politically, you're left-leaning, but you like to watch a little bit of right content to understand what the other side is thinking, for instance. An algorithm might determine that you actually are Republican-leaning, you know what I mean? And that's continually serving you things like that. So I think the argument that we're always better off because we give away elements of ourselves is actually a little bit flawed. I would argue that people don't understand the cumulative value of what they're giving away. And that's what one of the really critical issues um, that I see are. And I just want to respond to the notion of security and... um, privacy, that mm-hmm. trade-off, it's not always guaranteed that these systems mm-hmm. work. I'd like to point to San Diego. San Diego had a facial recognition system that ran for seven years, and a spokesperson of that system said that to her knowledge, it never implicated a single mm-hmm. suspect, right? So if we want to talk about economics, how many taxpayer dollars were wasted on something that didn't actually work? And when we talk about you know the police budgets, I think we would be remiss not to mention all the surveillance technology that's being constantly spent and integrated and brought in from other areas. So I think that it's very key to note that none of this is a sure bet. You could invest millions of dollars and then have very little payoff or no payoff, right? Or even to the point worse, where those people that were like, let's say, falsely implicated in Detroit, they launched civil suits that actually cost you money, additional on top of like, you know, the um, that cost. And like, let's say there was a, there was an interaction where they like they started arresting him, and he was like, I I know I didn't commit any crime. This is clearly wrong. He resisted, and then there was like the irreparable like loss of life. So I think that the notion of trade off is that it's never a guaranteed bet. And I'd argue that the police already have so many tools at their disposal that I don't think that this is another toy that should be added to their arsenal. Specifically, there may be a few certain cases where like, let's say in like, let's say terrorism, where I think that it's very valuable. But even that there's a brown senior who was falsely implicated. And this is by the Sri Lankan police. This is not by American forces, but she was living in, in the U.S. And I believe she was an American citizen, um, but I could be wrong about that. But she was a junior at Brown. And she was falsely implicated in the Easter bombings in Sri Lanka. And that was by facial recognition technology. So even that, like you you look at that and you have to ask yourself what else is being misidentified. And the hope there, though, is that if it's the FBI, the level of sophistication of the analysts would be higher than if, let's say, there's a small town in Oklahoma that has a very small budget and they're just running a simple photo that has like a simple, you know, arrow. So arguably with greater sophistication and training, you can minimize these issues. And arguably the larger agencies have a much uh, more competent grasp. But even that is just a thought. And it's not something that I can 100% tangibly prove because there's a lot of questions and a little bit of murkiness surrounding the reporting and the use of these technologies mm-hmm. by agents. It's interesting. There there seems, I think there's a, there's a disanalogy between the internet case and the FRT case. In the internet case, um, it's much more possible for an individual actor to like cease using Google Maps, Facebook, the internet in general, and thereby um, reduce the amount of, of their location data or their preference preferences being released to these companies that they can then use it to target them with advertising or what have you. Whereas I think FRT, there's much more of a collective action problem, right? So just like if enough cities or... Um, enough people are on board with FRT and legislation gets passed on that front, then even if you as an individual aren't okay with the trade-off that's being made between sort of your security and your freedom, um, it, it doesn't matter, right? There, there's no way to back out of the system. If there's if there's the, the architecture of a camera on a street corner, um, the camera's not going to turn off when you walk by simply because you don't, uh, you haven't signed the waiver, right? Um, and so I think yeah. that's that's one of the worrying aspects of FRT that's that's not perhaps um, uh, not perhaps present uh, in the in the internet case. Yeah, and I just want to add, I feel that facial recognition. One of the reasons why it's so transformative or disruptive, even, is that it allows it, it almost eradicates privacy. The reason why perpetual lineup is titled that is because traditionally with lineups, you either have to have the physical individual human beings in front of you or photos of them. 
And the notion is that with a database of photos, you have an infinite, almost a near infinite amount of people that you can search against and see like, is it this one? Is it this one? Is it this one? And so people often analogize facial recognition to everybody wearing a name tag, um, sometimes with their address and their full information on the street. And so just as Vaden pointed out, it's essentially like within two seconds, I can know so much about you, where you work, who your brother is, if you're connected on Facebook and things like that. So like it really transforms um, what our reasonable expectation of privacy is, if you want to use a legal term. So um, to pivot the conversation slightly, uh, I, I know you've done a, a lot of work in thinking about how uh, COVID has Im- impacted uh, facial recognition technology. I was wondering if you could just say some words about, about that, because we're currently living in this time, so it's a very uh, important subject. Definitely. Like I would say that 2020 has had uh, many, many surprises, and I think that facial recognition has set for a very interesting uh, next stage. So there's a few issues coming up. So first is the issue of mass. And so typically with facial recognition, for those of you that don't know, the way that facial recognition works is that it breaks a bunch of phenotypic features about your face into quantitative measurements. So certain measurements like the length between your pupils, the length of your nose bridge, the distance between your eyebrows, all those are transferred into quantitative measurements. And then based off of at least a minimum of, let's say, 25 features typically with most of these algorithms Mm -hmm. these days, um, and, t- and sometimes even hundreds, that's how it makes a predictive guess about whether you are, in fact, this person that's also tagged in this database. So wearing a mask, obviously, cuts off 50% of the real stand on your face. And so there's the issue of if we have a bunch of people on facial recognition systems and half of them are wearing masks because they're like, let's say, about to catch a train, how does that impact the function of the algorithm? And so in China, what's funny is that in the first few months of the pandemic, they actually did have some like speed bumps and some disruptions with their systems, because I mentioned from banking to entering their buildings and um, all these different applications on their phones, it's all facial recognition, or many, much of it is facial recognition, rather. So the issue that it comes with is uh, originally they had like, you know, issues with uh, their systems failing to operate at the same level of accuracy, but they're able to negotiate that essentially within a few months by having better algorithms that just use predictive algorithms on the upper half of your face. And so what's interesting about that is that the U.S. is sim- is similarly going to have some issues, but we're not as dependent on facial recognition. It exists, but we're, it's not as dependent as I would say China um, is. And so uh, the difference in how fast we'll be able to negotiate that mass corner mm-hmm. is that I believe we're going to take longer than China because they have access to greater pools of data and that there's a lot more interaction between their business sectors and their government. And so when it comes to kind of centralizing a lot of this information and creating better algorithms with larger label data sets, they're a little bit more apt to act rapidly. I think that the U.S. within like a year or two, I think that will develop better algorithms and kind of see around mass. But the other issue that people are using is that they're doing um, certain things like even just measuring like certain measurements and solely your eye um, alone. To do. So it's essentially it's not true facial recognition because it's not combining different features on the face. It's a different type of biometric identifier, but it's still using a feature that's on your face. So I think that is going to go through transformation where it's either going to negotiate the mask corner or it's going to rely on other elements of your face. So that's the first thing. Um, two, I think it's going to be heavily promoted during this time because it's contactless. So like anyone that's ever like, you know, use a pin pad or stuff, you probably have that moment now when you're thinking, I wonder how many hundreds of people have touched this and when the last time it was wiped down. Um, now people are really going to market specifically mm, uh, facial recognition for, let's say, point of sales because it allows you to pay for your, your goods and services without having to touch anything. Mm. And then even entering into buildings, for instance, you know, instead of having to like, you know, sign a checkboard or something, it could just take a picture of your face. I think we're going to see a lot more marketing of it. And as we've seen, the investment in facial recognition has significantly increased over the years. Um, and it's set to be another big year. So I, I think that during this time, it's going to be marketed more. And I think that there's going to be a danger, though, because in the rush for places like, let's say, schools, for instance, to um, go back to normal, they're going to want to integrate systems that expedite mm-hmm. that process. And they may not be thinking of the long term implications of, let's say, storing geometric facial data of their children every day for three years, mm-hmm. for instance. So I think that there are going to be a lot of people that are pressured into adopting facial recognition, but may not think fully of what are the considerations and dangers that go along with this. Uh, yeah, because I guess um, a lot of uh, facial recognition technology doesn't work when some of the face is obscured or if it's at a particular angle. But if uh, the technology is being developed to be uh, much more resilient to this because of masks, then when uh, people are not wearing masks, it will just be more resilient in general because it will be able to detect individuals uh, using less of less of the face. Um, that's, a, that's a really fascinating that's an interesting side effect of sort of um, global crises in general right like sort of people step on the gas to make our institutions and our systems robust um, under sort of emergency situations 
And so, you know, the COVID pandemic is one um, and like maybe World World War Two uh, was the last example. And so, we, you know, we sort of develop um, technologies and pour a lot of money into R&D during these periods uh, without perhaps giving sufficient thought to, to the consequences of what happens when, when the global crisis is over. Um, and, you know, t- technology to some extent is a rabbit you're pulling out of a hat. So, you know, once it's out, it's out um, and you can try and legislate it as much as possible. But, um, you know, a lot of our most productive periods in terms of like scientific and technological advancement are during periods of um, global conflict or global crisis. Uh, and so it's like a, an interesting, I guess, just yeah, facet of, <laughs> of uh, the, mm-hmm. the, uh, the time we're living in right now. Um, mm-hmm. what, yeah, one other thing I guess I wanted to talk about is just to get your sense of in, in, you know, in Steven's ideal world, what is the role of, of this technology, right? Like, um, if you, if, you know, going back 20 years, if you had had the power, the godlike power to put a moratorium on this technology, would you have done that? Obviously right now your work is in this constrained situation in which there's a bunch of private actors developing the technology anyway. So, you, you know, you have to be realistic in terms of uh, policy recommendations and stuff. But, you know, if you had the power to uh, completely disband this technology and have no one work on it, would you do that? Um, do you think it's valuable in certain situations, like, for example, airports, right? I think uh, speaking of a situation in which we're all used to, like, giving up some of our freedom for more security, airports are, are a great example. Um, and so are you in favor of it in, in certain settings? Sort of, you know, what is what is your ideal uh, technological uh, world look like? For sure. And if I can just quickly comment on the airport thing. What's fascinating about airports is that, as you've noticed, uh, facial recognition is increasingly being used at um, airports. Um, And what's fascinating is it used to only be to catch, um, let me rephrase that. The introduction of facial recognition at airports was primarily used to catch potential uh, Mm -hmm. terrorists, but it started catching people that had visa overstays. Like it was almost too good, right? And so there's a question of what do you do now? And so typically where they may just let you come back into the country because they feel like that's not their job. Almost like if you've ever gotten past TSA with just like, you know, a razor for your face by oxygen mm-hmm. or something like that. Like what do you do when the net is almost too powerful? So it's creating a lot of those kind of questions as well. Um, but to the issue of what I would do, I would say that when I first started this research, I was very much on the Bannett train. And then I think that after a little bit more months of research and seeing how integrated it was into our government and into also our military heavily, um, I felt that there's that you can't put the genie back in the box. Um, I think that the recent protests, though, in the last like few months have really shown me that with enough public uh, outcry and engagement, though, that there are massive shifts that we can do to our criminal justice system. And so I'm wondering if it is back, if it is possible to actually restrain this technology. And if you look at California and Massachusetts, a bunch of cities within those two states have really taken up the, the ban of government use of facial recognition mm-hmm. technology, even though there's certain parts that are covered. So like, I, I find myself wondering if it is better to scale back. But if we're, ta- if we're saying that scaling back long before we had, um, any of this, right? What I would do. So I would actually say I want to give people the ability to make democratically informed decisions about the safety in their communities. So very similar to Vaden's point. I think that if I, let's say I go to a grocery store that's like special for some reason that has facial recognition for both entry and payment. I think that if I, as an individual, if I'm given transparent information about how that information is stored, where they got it, what are they comparing it against, you know, any liability insurance they have, and the fact that it's siloed and it will never be transferred to someone else, I myself may feel that that's a great implication. And I think that as a consumer, I should be able to like, you know, essentially vote with my feet, if you will. And similarly, I think that if you live in a community and after weighing all the considerations and you're fair and you're fairly certain that your government has like a responsible best interest in your heart for not only you, but also people that don't look like you, I think that you should be able to vote to democratically allow facial recognition in your society for specific things. Furthermore, certain things like your identification on your phone, often being that the hash is stored on your phone locally. So like Apple doesn't actually have your facial geometry. I think that that is also a very valuable thing. And I think that you should be allowed to do that if you want, right? Now, there's a bunch of issues with, let's say, ring doorbells, right? Where we could say for the entrance to my own house, I could be able to do that because it's my own property. But if I have a ring doorbell that's activated anytime someone passes it, or what are the rights of the UPS driver that comes to my house every Thursday to drop off mm-hmm. a package, right? Like, you know, people that casually pass by, like, what are their rights? But I, I think that 
moving to a democratic approach instead of allowing it to be the decision to be made by a few people who only reviewed like two or three pitches or bids, right? I think that moving away from that system where decisions for millions are made literally by a few and then the reporting obligations are so Mm. minimal in terms of how that situation is functioning are there any false positives what happened to the people that were falsely implicated like i think if all those key questions could be answered i think we could rest these and we could make democratic decisions for independent cities and communities Mm. but i think that at the current state if i knew what was going to happen i would refrain from using facial recognition in any um i would say state and local um uh, investigations, mm-hmm. except maybe let's say child sexual abuse and things mm-hmm. of that nature. But that's what about um, uh, warrants? So, like a warrant is uh, a, a t- basically temporarily allowing something illegal to happen because some judge has deemed that this uh, uh, is for a higher good. So, could you imagine uh, putting a warrant system on it, where police have to get warrants in order to use uh, uh, facial recognition uh, from a judge? Yeah, I would be much more comfortable with the warrant system. I don't think it solves everything because warrants can sometimes be uh, granted on, let's say, less than 100% truthful information. Um, But I do think that having the standard of at least someone else who is removed from the police department who is able to be able to look at the situation objectively and be able to say, hey, is there a probable cause that there has been a crime Mm -hmm. committed? I would feel much more comfortable. Mm -hmm. So, like, let's say if everyone had to get a warrant before they use it, I think that that would be an extremely positive um, Mm -hmm. step forward um, in the uh, conversation. But even that, you need to train judges on exactly how to interpret these algorithms. And part of my research is determining what is the competency currently of legal professionals in general when it comes to understanding the statistics of machine learning algorithms and what would you need to kind of differentiate different facial recognition algorithms. Mm -hmm. And the issue with that, though, is even experts have issues benchmarking this technology. Mm -hmm. And if you're curious about the subject, uh, the NIST report, which stands for the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, they did a three-part benchmarking series on facial recognition algorithms. And that's, I would say, the closest that we have to composite view of these algorithms relative to each other in terms of performance. Mm -hmm. But there hasn't been nearly enough work for us to competently compare these two yeah, well, uh, or sorry not two the, the variety of uh, the gamut really. um i would like one particularly worrying thing which i'm hoping to god is not going to be implemented is facial recognition coupled with automatic weaponry uh, because you could have say targeted missiles um so let's just say that that dystopian future is far away but if it's facial recognition um and then coupled with human validation so it says here are five people who could look like the person you're trying to find, uh, but then a human being has to make that final decision, um, which is, I think, more likely what's what's uh, in place. Uh, then, then the um, the error rate uh, is just going to return a higher number of, of people in the perpetual lineup, um, which would then still need to be uh, 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 reviewed by a human being, um, and humans can detect faces. Uh, quite quite easily, so that would be at least be one one way to uh, um, soften the the impacts of, of facial recognition. If like, so I'm quite in favor of a, a warrant system, just to say where my uh, cars lie. Because one, it's coming. Two, if it's going to be here, we should make it uh, effective. Um, that was an interesting, I think, tension between some of the recommendations in the uh, perpetual lineup. They're saying it doesn't work, but also it works really well but also we should make it better, but also we should slow its growth. Um, and so I could see something where we uh, we recognize that, yeah, Clearview AI is going to have a big data set, so we should have this large data set, but it should be under lock and key. And uh, similar to um, the conversation that Snowden uh, opened up about uh, when should uh, government agencies get access to uh, the metadata from phone records. Um, now you have to get a warrant in order to get access to, to that, and you need probable cause, et cetera, et cetera. I can imagine something like that where you uh, need uh, to get a warrant to get access to the big data set, um, and without that warrant, that it's it's too much of a breach of our civil uh, civil liberties. That's an opinion, uh, uninformed opinion, but that, that's one thing that could, could be placed. And if I can point out, the human in the loop is a very important concept here, um, especially in military mm. and uh, kind of weapons applications, if you will. So one funny thing about humans, right, it's identifying people you've never seen in real life is actually sometimes a very difficult task. And there's differences in people identifying people of different races. So, for instance, you know, if you have like a Caucasian um, analyst like reviewing people of Arab descent, they may they may have a lower accuracy rate than an Arab examiner. Right. So I, I think that 
what's fascinating about that is that you can train people though to become face examiners like i'm not exactly sure the full certification but there's a way to train people so they get better at identifying human faces <laughs> Interesting. and so that's often used like let's say by the fbi once you run the initial query they have someone that runs through the photos so i think that human in the loop and not having automated kind of determinations is very key because sometimes it is as simple as looking but you know the, de the determination of whether these are the same two individuals this could be just be two guys that are just like you know in a car trying to make a decision about something that's extremely life-altering or potentially lethal consequences so mm -hmm. it's a tricky game too like sometimes you want to like rely fully on the human but then also not too much mm -hmm. yeah. and you kind of run into the issue of also like how human witnesses are just scientifically and historically not yeah, always so fallible, <laughs> spot on right? it's so. like the worst kind of testimony eyewitness testimony i think it's the testimony yeah. that's the least reliable right so yeah having a human in the loop can not always be a, a great thing i guess but I, I was this testimony is more about memory than it is about facial recognition right uh, because it, you yeah, have to recall you could, what you yeah. what you memorized or what you remembered um but your but, memory uh, of the faces. But, right? but I would argue, yeah, your memory of the faces, but I'd argue perhaps if like the person had originally interpreted the face and like cemented it correctly, it would be easier to recall mm -hmm. rather than kind of like, you know, I don't know, it kind of mm -hmm. looks like both of those guys, two and three. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a tricky situation. Yeah. Um, and so we've talked a lot about the uh, public sector and particularly on, say, domestic um, policing issues. But what about the private sector? Um, uh I want to get to Clearview AI so that people can can look that up. But uh, but just what are your thoughts in general about how it's being used in the private sector? Um, so let's first talk a little about applications, mm -hmm. and I'll talk about perception. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the applications in the private sector, some of them are very fascinating. So for instance, there's this new, not even new, this is like a few years old, but there was a uh, application called Civil War Sleuth. And so people were uploading pictures of Civil War um, portraits, uh, kind of just like, you know, that like the uh, like the President Lincoln, just like, you know, looking very firm and everything. And so they were doing that to try to identify unknown people in different portraits. And so that's one application, right? That's like kind of fascinating. Now you could get into like, are there ever portraits or pictures of like, let's say military operations where the people are supposed to remain anonymous for sure, right? Yeah. Um, but it's interesting that you can kind of posthumously look back and start to identify and make certain relationship connections. And I think that's fascinating. And we already talked about advertising both within stores. Yeah. Um, there's some other ones that d dig a little bit more into like sentiment analysis. Mm -hmm. So trying to determine your emotion, like let's say in different situations, um, whether that be like your receptiveness to different ads we or should, content and things like well, that. I, I want to add here that um, for a lot of these different applications, uh, you need different kinds of labels. Um, and so that's something that you had mentioned earlier that may have flown past people, but I just want to highlight what that means because in machine learning that the word label uh, – is used for a very specific thing. Um, so label is just a human annotator giving the right answer. And so if, for example, you uh, want to do uh, just detect person to another person, uh, excuse, sorry, detect an image um, and figure out which person uh, this is, then you can essentially get all the labels for free because most images have that information contained in the, in the metadata. You can look at the Facebook profile from which the image is kept. But if you wanted to do facial recognition for sentiment, it's a little bit more challenging because you need a human being saying happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad. Um, and if you wanted to do facial recognition for, say, uh, detecting COVID uh, patients uh, or people who have, say, showing signs of COVID, that is more challenging still because you need a doctor saying this person has COVID, this person doesn't have COVID, this person has COVID. And so the uh, it's not that all of these applications are going to be equally feasible um, and uh, certain applications are going to be really far away because you always need a human being or at least some um, true answer, which you can scrape off the internet associated with each of these uh, images. Uh, and so I just want to add that uh, uh, because we talk about facial recognition as if it's all equally um, feasible and coming and, and there's many different um, uh, uh, cases where it's, it's much more challenging. So Definitely. And yeah, so just to also add to that, which is a great point, they and um, Knowing whether this is or is not someone is a binary determination that has an objective truth. Whether I'm happy or sad mm, nice. could be cultural mm. impacted or it could just be situational, excellent right? Point, you know? point. It's like, I might be distraught, but yeah. maybe my dog really did just yeah. die, right? So it's like, there's certain like a uh, considerations when it comes face. to labeling emotions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're always looking like you're sad, but you're actually quite, quite happy. So, sorry to cut you off. I just wanted to say rest. Exactly, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. So, you know, 
It could be on some new medication that just makes you yeah, more mellow, yeah. right? So there's always the margin of error. And when you're labeling emotions specifically, that's for sure. Yeah. Thing, right? There's almost the NLP issue with like social media comments, exactly. right? It's very hard to detect whether someone's serious or not, you know, and people miss exactly. those commas. And it's, it's a very, it's a very um, hard task to solve. Exactly. And I just want to point out something really quickly too. Um, within facial recognition, come, when it's unlocking your phone, that's a one-to-one -one comparison. And then when doing it in a full database of like, let's say across a city of people, that's actually one-to-many, which is a very slight mm -hmm. distinction. But if you're actually interested in this area, delving into that distinction is a little bit more uh, mm -hmm. nuanced than you might assume. But um, to talk about Clearview AI, uh, as I mentioned before, um, it differs from previous facial recognition applications because of how the data sets are created. <laughs> so it is that it is collecting labeled data from publicly available information on social media platforms. And as I mentioned before, um, previously the government would not be able to do that necessarily. And what's interesting is originally the creator of the of Clearview AI, Hone Tone Thought, I believe is how you say his name. I could be wrong. But uh, essentially, he had claimed that they only use it for law enforcement. But then it came out that he had licensed it to like this billionaire who used it to stalk his daughter's date. Um, and then uh, they also, when he claimed that they didn't license to law enforcement, that was proven false because certain companies like Macy's and the NBA had at least demoed and in certain situations, like gotten into full licensing agreements with Clearview AI. So the notion that they lied first about who the customer base and where it's being used um, is an issue. Um, and kind of the safeguards that they had in place. But this is really redefining because a lot of people felt relatively safe on the internet and the scraping of data, people felt that the terms of service would at least be enough to prevent it. But although the company sent cease and desist letters, there's a question about whether um, there has been like essentially enough uh, pushback, right? And so I guess the, there are several big questions about Clear AI. Um, but the first is, is this ethically sourced data? And I feel like not enough people ask, is it possible to create ethically sourced facial recognition systems, right? And so I mentioned that a lot of the original systems were based off of college students who consensually gave their information. And that's one scenario. Others would be that people just put up a camera in a coffee shop that had a lot of high traffic and they collected it over a week or two weeks and they just started uh, cropping and labeling the faces and everything like that. So the way that people get their information, that's the true question about whether you can build something at scale that can truly facilitate thousands of searches without infringing on anyone's privacy. And the second issue is even if that is right, should we specifically encourage this behavior? Um, and then so I believe that the New Jersey Police Department um, specifically forbade people from using Clearview AI. Um, or some, it was some city within the Northeast. Forgive me if that's wrong, but it, it was uh, funny to see that there's now, from a regulatory standpoint, certain people that are saying we will not use these specific applications because of how they were created. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of questions that Clearview AI um, has kind of brought up, and I'm just interested to see where this goes. Just a quick plug for uh, John Oliver. Actually, he did an excellent piece on on this, and uh, he talks a lot about Clearview AI and the Perpetual Lineup uh, Project. And so just Google John Oliver. Uh, facial recognition technology. And um, if you want a quick, funny primer to, to the issue, uh, that was actually a, a very good piece, piece of his. Uh, Stephen, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any quick thoughts on sort of IBM, sort of a couple of big companies like recent retraction of their, uh, the use of facial recognition technology um, and how, you know, what sort of actors are selling it to and whatnot. Obviously, you know, the U S is, is kind of undergoing this, this reckoning with, uh, police brutality and, and the behavior of their police forces. And um, so faced with some backlash, I think like IBM, Amazon and Microsoft uh, sort of uh, retracted the use of their uh, FRT from police forces, if I'm understanding it correctly. So they just like um, are not allowing uh, the police to actually use their, their platforms anymore. Yeah, I'm wondering if you have thoughts on this, if this is you think this is maybe just like a publicity stunt or something, or if this is actually going, if this is kind of showing democracy in progress where big companies are responsive to the people. Um, and yeah, just what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so just to clarify for people, uh, IBM said that they would no longer sell or develop facial recognition. Amazon said that they would place a one-year moratorium until federal uh, regulations developed. And then Microsoft said that they would not sell facial recognition until uh, some type of guidance had been established. And so they wouldn't sell it specifically to uh, law enforcement. Um, I think what's really fascinating about this, though, is that uh, I guess when I first heard it, I was uh, pretty happy. But I think that with a closer microscope, this isn't as significant as we would like to see. So the first reason is market share. 
right? So when you look at the biggest vendors of facial recognition, they're often companies like Dataworks and NEC. And when I say largest, I mean that they're getting very large contracts with major U.S. Mm-hmm. cities. And so the, the 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 significance of that is that often they're being paid to not only like supply the cameras, but then also connect it, store the data, and then any type of analytics that's run, it's often on their own clouds. So it's not just the algorithm that they're providing, they're providing an entire infrastructure. So I'd point out that Amazon and IBM do not hold huge market shares of facial recognition. It's kind of hard to know because there's not a lot of good uh, reporting or record keeping on this specifically. But uh, it's very key to know that they are not the biggest players. And there's a lot of even international um, companies like NAC, which I just mentioned. Sorry, excuse me which have a much larger stake. So when you look at the percentage of their businesses, these three companies do not, they are not the biggest market uh, players in the field. And then also if you look at the percentage of their business, that's not too much of a movement. And I would also put forth that I feel like there's a little bit of moral high standing going mm. on right now to where these people are not necessarily being genuine. And Microsoft actually got slammed by, I believe it was the intercept recently because it was shown that although they did not technically sell facial recognition, their platform, Microsoft Azure was providing extensive um, analytics support, or sorry, extensive uh, infrastructure and cloud support to law enforcement mm-hmm. agencies. And at times they had partners that were working with facial recognition technology. So even though they didn't That's have it thing. themselves, they were enabling it either directly through providing a platform that it could be built off of, or they had partners that were directly in that space. And so there we're almost getting to war semantics. And I'd almost say you would have had more to stand if you had just said nothing. (laughs) And the reason why I'm a little bit frustrated with Microsoft is that they've been, um, uh, when it comes to facial recognition, they've been very vocal about how they feel that it's uh, too dangerous of a technology and it shouldn't be used. But um, they've quietly been backing certain bills in certain states. So there was a bill that passed in Washington recently, which actually allowed facial recognition to occur in certain circumstances in like the private sector. And it was a he- it was a bill that was heavily lobbied by Microsoft. And they tried to do the same thing in California, but that bill just passed. That bill failed ultimately. And so I think looking at the lobbying expenditures of these major companies can sometimes indicate whether there's another motive or whether they're being genuine or not. So I feel a little bit betrayed by Microsoft in that they came out as like this like major. Um, moral hero in this area when they're really doing a lot more that others may feel infringed on civil liberties by supporting certain um, law enforcement efforts. So I I think that as much as I want to believe that this was like, you know, um, huge for the industry, I would say it's not. But I think that there is some value in industry leaders coming out and saying, we admit that this technology is very dangerous. Because I think that the biggest part in this discussion is getting people to realize that this is not a harmless technology and that the version that we see today may not be what we see tomorrow and that you've never seen almost the final form, if you will, of this technology. So I think that even just getting people to understand that this is not, you know, some, you know, willy nilly, just like completely harmless thing is, is part of the struggle. And so I think that them at least acknowledging on a service level, this could be abused is huge. Nice. Um, yeah. Any other warnings for people um, before we wrap up here? <laughs> and, and also uh, uh, let people know where they can find you and find yeah. your work online yeah. as well. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So um, as I mentioned, I'm a, a fellow at the Codex Center for Legal Informatics. I actually uh, just built a personal website where you can go and check out some of my work. It is canes.tech. Canes is my last name. C-A-I-N-E-S dot tech, T-E-C-H, um, where you can check out some of uh, my other work and another podcast I did and some other great stuff. Uh, I, I would say that if I had to leave people with anything, it would be that your privacy is worth so much more than you think. And I think that we live in a society where it encourages you to trade pieces of it in sense for free services and things like that. And while I do enjoy the benefit of that in certain circumstances, I think that there is a grave danger in the centralization of information. And I think that the more we strip away these unique identifiers like your face and your biometric identifiers, the greater danger that there is for abuse, maybe not today, but in the near future. And so I think that when we talk about how visible we are on the internet and exactly what our footprint is, I think it's also very critical to analyze exactly how could these be used against us? And I hate to sound like that paranoid person, but like I I really do believe in the same sense that health is wealth, privacy is also wealth. And so I would encourage everybody to really put a critical lens to who and to what's visible online and exactly how that could come across to you. And I think that whenever you hear surveillance being thrown about, about your community, about where you live, I think it's on you to ask more questions and make sure that you're coming from an informed place. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. We'll definitely yes, have you uh, back on when America has gone full North Korea. You'll be the person <laughs> to talk to you at that point. <laughs> yeah. We'll both be wearing masks and uh, <laughs> no microphones or cameras, but we'll, 
Uh, that was awesome, man. It was so good. I hope you come back mm. soon. And uh, and yeah, I, I learned a lot. So great, great conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. Really happy to be here, guys. Thank you.